So, in this lecture, we will um, uh, start uh, uh, discussing air standard cycles. And as I had uh, mentioned earlier, we will look at um, uh, three uh, engines or two types of engines. Uh, one is the uh, gas turbine engine. Uh, and the other two are actually automotive engines. So, we will uh, uh, look at the uh, spark ignition engine and the compression ignition engine under the category of automotive uh, engines. Now, in all these three engines, atmospheric air is taken in as the, uh, as the working substance. Now, after it undergoes compression, fuel is uh, then uh, added to the air stream and um, in some cases air is taken in, fuel is mixed and then it undergoes compression, but it does not matter. Atmospheric air is taken in as the working substance, fuel is added to the atmospheric air and the oxygen in the air is used for the combustion of the fuel. So, when the fuel burns, the temperature of the mixture increases and it then undergoes further uh, thermodynamic processes. Okay. So, the working substance is, uh, is clean air until combustion takes place. After that, uh, it is actually a mixture of combustion gases. Okay? So, for this reason, the, uh, the process executed in this engine is not a cyclic process because we cannot take the combustion gases and send them back to the beginning of the process. So, they have to be exhausted into the ambient and uh, fresh air has to be admitted into the engine. Okay. So, the important thing is the, the processes that take place in these engines uh, do not uh, constitute a cyclic process. So, then the question that arises is you know why then are we actually looking at uh, um, uh, looking at uh, cyclic process if the actual process in the application is not a cyclic process. The primary reason is this. Um, so, we can carry out a thermodynamic analysis of the uh, cyclic process. And we assume that air alone is the working substance when we do this. Okay, so this is of course an idealization. Okay, and um, uh, the cyclic process is usually called an air standard cycle. Although the practical uh, realizations are quite different, the uh, analysis that we do now uh, with the air standard cycle uh, gives us two important insights into the cycle. Number one, the parameters that control the performance of the cycle that is number one and number two, how these parameters affect the performance of the cycle. So, it allows us to uh, identify parameters that control the performance of the cycle. It also gives us insights on how these parameters affect the performance of the cycle. And these uh, insights that we get from the air standard analysis can be carried over directly to the practical realization. So, the same parameters will control the performance of the device that we are talking about and their effect on the performance of the device will be the same as what we see in an air standard cycle. That is the motivation for uh, actually doing an air standard analysis. Although it appears to be far from the actual realization, the insights that it provides carry over directly to the practical application. Okay? So, that is, uh, that is the motivation for doing air standard cycles. Okay? So, we start with uh, the, um, uh, the gas turbine engine first, then spark ignition and then uh, compression ignition engine. Now, in all these cases, at least the uh, for the air standard cycle, the performance metrics are the same as what we used in the, uh, in the case of the Rankine cycle. So, specific power, first law efficiency based on um, uh, energy based efficiency and then second law efficiency. So, these are the uh, the three performance metrics that uh, we will be looking at in the case of uh, air standard cycles also. The uh, first one uh, of course is the gas turbine engine which operates on the so called uh, well it is the air standard Brayton cycle. The, uh, the actual engine as I said you know does not execute a complete cyclic process, but uh, all the other uh, processes are executed. So, basically atmospheric air is taken inside uh, the engine into a compressor section. So, as you can see this is the compressor section in the engine where the air is compressed uh, through a pressure ratio typically around uh, 30 or 40 to 1. Okay. The air then goes into a combustor which is, uh, which is here. Here fuel is sprayed into the air stream 
and the mixture of fuel and air then undergoes combustion in the combustion chamber ok. And the peak temperatures um, are usually seen in this part of the cycle and they can be of the order of about 1300 to 1400 degree Celsius pro probably around 1350 degree Celsius or so. So, the air then expands in uh, in the turbine which is uh, shown here. <coughs> we have many uh, rows of uh, turbine blades. So, here only the rotor blades are shown, stator blades which are fixed to the casing have been uh, removed. So, this is an inside view of the exposed view of the rotor of the gas turbine engine. So, there are many rows of uh, uh, turbine blades and you can see that you know the, the diameter of the uh, turbine blade increases as uh, the flow goes through ok, because the flow undergoes an expansion and uh, to accommodate the expansion the height of the blades also increases in the flow direction. So, here yeah. as you can see in the case of the compressor the height of the blade decreases because the flow undergoes a compression process. So, after undergoing expansion the flow then leaves the, uh, uh, the engine ok. Now, as it undergoes expansion uh, power that is required to run the compressor is extracted from the turbine and the rest of the uh, power is used to actually uh, run a generator to produce electricity ok. So, this uh, is a realization for a land based power plant. So, this is used for power generation uh, that is land based power generation. So, the uh, output that we get from the turbine is partly used to run the compressor and the rest is used to run a generator which produces electricity. Now, notice that the air that is taken in the front undergoes all these processes and then it is exhausted to the ambient and not taken back into the uh, compressor section ok, because the air is no longer clean. Here we are looking at an aviation application. This is the cutaway view of a uh, General Electric G9X uh, engine which is uh, considered to be state of the art. This is the largest engine in uh, production today and the most powerful engine in uh, production today. Uh, and as you can see the layout is very similar except for the fan in the front. So, this is the fan in the front. This is actually a turbo fan engine. So, it has a huge fan in the front. When I say huge, uh, the diameter of the fan is, uh, is 11 feet. Ok. So, the diameter of the fan uh, here is about the uh, same as the fuselage of a 737 aircraft ok. So, the engine uh, fan has the same diameter as the fuselage of a 737. So, you can imagine how big it is, it is 11 feet uh, in diameter ok. But apart from that you can see the core gas turbine engine inside and you see the, the uh, compressor section here. So, there are multiple compressor sections as you can see the compressor section extends all the way up to there. Uh, we then have the combustor and then we have multiple rows of uh, expansion or turbine blades. And as you can see the, uh, uh, the diameter of the uh, blades or the height of the blades increases so that the diameter of the rotor also increases to accommodate the expansion of the fluid. Okay. So, the power that is generated by the turbine is uh, partly used to run the compressors as well as the fan. The uh, rest is actually, uh, uh, well let me put it this way, the uh, power produced by the turbine is used to run the compressor and the fan. The remaining enthalpy in the gases is then converted into kinetic energy into the nozzle which is uh, located downstream like this ok. So, the enthalpy of the gases is converted to power in the turbine which is used to run the compressor and the fan. The remaining enthalpy is converted to kinetic energy in the nozzle and used for propulsion purposes ok. In that case also the air that is taken in um, is mixed with the fuel. So, the exhaust gases are sent out into the atmosphere as they are not taken back into the engine. Okay. So, the cyclic, so there is no cyclic process that is executed in this case also. 
Okay. So, both the land based uh, gas turbine engine and the uh, uh, one used for aviation application use the Brayton uh, cycle, but the process is not a cyclic process. So, what we will do in the air standard cases, we will look at an air standard Brayton cycle, which is uh, an idealization of these types of applications. So, this engine as I said has maximum temperatures around uh, 1350 uh, degree Celsius and the overall pressure ratio uh, in this case is about 60 or so. It is among the uh, most powerful engines and this pressure ratio is extremely high and it has a bypass ratio of uh, 10. Now, what this number means is that for every kilogram per second of air that goes through the core gas turbine engine, 10 kilogram per second goes through the fan. Okay. So, it is a high bypass ratio uh, turbo fan engine which is why the fan diameter is so high. So, these numbers uh, pressure ratio 60, uh, maximum temperature 1350 degree Celsius, these are typical of uh, gas turbine applications, although this is on the higher side. Typically, we would uh, be having pressure ratios around 40 or so. Okay? So, we will keep this in mind when we actually do the air standard Brayton cycle. So, we may um, uh, draw or illustrate the Brayton cycle in uh, block diagram form like this. Okay. So, we start with the air, typically uh, ambient air at 100 kilo Pascal, 300 Kelvin temperature. It goes to a compressor where it is compressed through a pressure ratio, uh, let us say 30 or 40. And the air is then uh, taken to a combustor. Notice that here, this is an air standard cycle. So, the air is never mixed with the fuel. So, the combustor essentially is nothing but a heat exchanger. So, heat is added in the combustor to the air stream and it gets heated up. It then goes to the turbine where it undergoes an expansion process. Part of the power generated by the turbine is used to run the compressor and the rest goes out. Uh, if it is a land based application, the rest will be utilized to run a generator for producing power. Otherwise, the uh, high enthalpy gases, uh, otherwise there is no uh, work output or power output, high enthalpy gases are taken to the nozzle for thrust generation. Okay, so, in this case, after undergoing expansion, the air comes out, it is then taken to a cooler which plays the uh, role of a condenser. Remember, we had a condenser in the Rankine cycle. Here we have a cooler which is also a heat exchanger. So, heat is rejected to the ambient here. So, the temperature of the air is about 300 Kelvin when it comes out of the cooler and after expansion the turbine, the pressure is also 100 kilo Pascal. So, the cycle can be repeated. So, if the cycle is illustrated on a TS diagram, it uh, looks like this. So, we have compression from uh, this pressure to the higher pressure. So, basically, uh, this cycle also operates between two isobars just like the Rankine cycle. Okay? And we have compression from state 1 to state 2s in case it is an isentropic compression process. In the case of uh, uh, an actual compression process, the uh, exit state at the uh, exit of the compressor would be uh, state 2 or the state at the exit of the compress, uh, compressor would be state 2. Heat is then added uh, to the working substance until it reaches uh, state 3 and then uh, the fluid undergoes expansion in uh, the turbine from 3 to 4 s to the uh, lower pressure. Heat is then rejected in the uh, uh, in the cooler uh, as shown by process 4 s to 1 and then the cycle is repeated. Um, in this case also uh, like what we did with the Brayton cycle without any loss of generality, we will assume uh, the uh, compressor and the turbine efficiency to be 100 percent in all our examples. Um, uh, other values for uh, actual or realistic values for this can easily be uh, accommodated in, in our analysis. So, there is no loss of generality in uh, assuming uh, the compression and expansion process to be ideal. 
Now, since the uh, compression and expansion process are ideal, uh, the um, area under the curve actually denotes the, uh, the heat interaction. So, this is, this is the heat rejected and um, this is the heat that is supplied, this is the heat that is supplied and the difference uh, is uh, shown here. So, this would be the difference let us just, uh, so that is the difference and as we uh, know from our um, uh, uh, first law for a cyclic process. So, this is uh, equal to q h minus q c uh, every cycle and that is equal to uh, w net and that is what is shown here. Uh, normally, uh, when we um, look at air standard uh, Brayton cycle, we assume that the uh, peak temperature in the cycle T3 is fixed. So, we assume that uh, the uh, maximum temperature in the cycle is fixed. Okay, that is a reasonable assumption to make because we cannot have any arbitrarily high temperature. Remember, the 1350 degree Celsius that I mentioned in connection with this, this itself is a very high temperature. This is about uh, 300 to 400 degree Celsius above the melting point of most metals and alloys. But still, in this application, the blades do not melt because of the uh, excellent uh, blade cooling system uh, that is used. Okay. So, it is reasonable to assume uh, that the peak temperature is fixed and that is what we will uh, actually use in the uh, analysis. Okay, so, if I apply steady flow energy equation to each one of the component, we get um, uh, the power required by the compressor to be equal to this. And if you assume uh, air to be calorically perfect, then we can actually write this as uh, m dot Cp times T2s minus T1 assuming air to be calorically perfect. That is why we are saying uh, ideal here. Uh, we can uh, do the same thing for uh, the um, uh, heat addition in the combustor and the power produced by the turbine. And since uh, 1 to 2s is isentropic, we may write it like this uh, T2s equal to T1 times P2s over P1 raised to the, the power gamma minus 1 over gamma and the same for T4s. Remember P2s and P3 and P4s and P1 lie in the same isobar. So, uh, P2s and uh, P3, I am sorry, state 2s and state 3 and state 4s and state 1 lie on the same isobar. So, uh, we may uh, write this and I can eventually write it like this where Rp is the pressure ratio. So, the performance metrics that we are looking for uh, are Wx dot specific power as well as thermal efficiency. So, we may write uh, Wx dot net equal to this after making use of the expressions that we have derived so far and heat supplied may be written like this after substituting for the temperatures and we get uh, thermal efficiency of the cycle to be equal to this. So, these expressions make clear that there are two parameters that control the performance of the cycle. Okay, remember, that was one of the uh, insights that we actually wanted from the analysis, from the air standard analysis. So, T3 over T1 and Rp are the two parameters that affect the performance of the cycle. So, Wx dot uh, net depends on both of them. Although, in the ideal case, when we assume the isentropic efficiency to be 100 percent, the efficiency does not depend on T3 uh, over T1. But, uh, if you relax that assumption, then definitely eta will also depend on T3 over T1. <coughs> Nonetheless, uh, Wx dot specific power is a uh, uh, metric, performance metric that we are looking at. So, uh, that depends on T3 over T1 and Rp and efficiency in this case depends only on Rp. So, we have plotted here in this uh, graph Wx dot uh, net over m dot Cp times T1 on the y axis and efficiency eta on the x axis for various values of T3 over T1. So, T3 over T1 equal to 6 for this curve, T3 over T1 equal to 5 for this curve, 
T3 over T1 equal to 4 for this curve. The solid line uh, corresponds to uh, compressor and turbine isentropic efficiencies to be 100 percent. Okay, and uh, along each one of this uh, curve, the pressure ratio Rp varies from 5 to 40. Okay, that is uh, typical. So, we have uh, allowed it to vary from 5 to 40. So, you can see that uh, if I draw a vertical line from any of these curves, uh, irrespective of uh, T3 over T1, uh, the efficiency is the same right, for all these values. So, uh, the efficiency values are the same. Uh, for uh, all these uh, three lines, which uh, sh uh, clearly shows that eta does not depend on T3 over T1. However, um, you can see that uh, the specific work generally increases with, uh, uh, with Rp and then reaches a maximum, then begins to decrease. Efficiency increases continue monotonically with Rp as you can see from here. As I move along this curve, efficiency continues to increase. Right? However, Wx uh, dot net over m dot cpt1 uh, increases with Rp, reaches a maximum and then starts to decrease. Notice that these values of T3 over T1 that we have chosen are also very representative of realistic applications. As I said, the maximum temperature in the cycle could be around 1350 uh, degrees Celsius and air itself, so which is nothing but which works out to maybe something like uh, approximately 1600 Kelvin and the air itself enters at about uh, 300 Kelvin. So, a typical value for T3 over T1 would be between 5 and 6. Okay. So, that is what we are looking at uh, here. Okay. Although this value of 1350 will be smaller for smaller engines. Okay. So, 4, 5 and 6 nicely encompass all the practical realizations that we can think of. Okay. Now, let us return to the variation of W dot uh, net with uh, Rp. Okay. Let us see whether we can get some uh, insights from the TS diagram. So, let me just uh, erase some of these things. Okay. Now, assuming that the uh, maximum temperature in the cycle is fixed. Okay. Notice that this one uh, illustrates the same cycle, but for a higher pressure ratio. Notice that the pressure ratio here is between this isobar and this isobar. So, that is higher. And if I have, uh, if I draw the cycle for a lower value of pr uh, pressure ratio compared to this, it will look something like this. Let me just use a slightly different color for this. So, that is for a slightly um, uh, lower value of uh, pressure ratio compared to this cycle and uh, you can see the W net ideal in that case would look something like this. So, as the pressure ratio is increased, this uh, state point 3 uh, keeps moving uh, to the left. And if you look at the area uh, included inside the cyclic process curve, you can see that you know the area, uh, it is clear that the area begins to increase and then once the pressure ratio becomes really high, uh, the area uh, in the process curve begins to decrease and that is the trend that we are seeing here. So, you can see that the, the, um, uh, the uh, net power increases initially with Rp reaches a maximum and then starts to decrease. In fact, by, uh, by differentiating this expression uh, for Rp, so by differentiating this expression for, I am sorry, for uh, W dot net with uh, respect to Rp, we can actually uh, show that the uh, specific work is a maximum when Rp is equal to uh, square root of T3 over T1 raised to gamma over gamma minus 1. Now, for this case, T2s becomes equal to T4s. Corresponding to this pressure ratio, uh, T2s uh, becomes equal to T4s. Okay? So, this would be a cycle for which
So, T2S will be equal to T4S. <coughs> it will not be exactly the same state, the state will slide down, but at for some uh, pressure ratio, T2S will become equal. So, 2S will move like this and 4S will keep sliding down this isobar like this. So, for a particular value of pressure ratio, which is given by the expression that we derived, T2S will be equal to T4S and that is when the uh, specific work is a maximum. Now, the next question is uh, purely theoretical, purely academic. How high can we go in, uh, in pressure ratio? Is there an upper value? Is there a limiting value for uh, pressure ratio? Notice that when I keep increasing the pressure ratio like this, um, uh, 2S as I said keeps moving along this line. And eventually, we are, come to, uh, we are going to come to a situation where uh, 2S uh, becomes equal to the maximum allowed temperature in the cycle. So, 3 keeps moving like this, eventually 2S and 3 merge for that pressure ratio when the exit temperature from the compressor is the maximum allowed, which means no more heat can be added, which means that this is a motoring cycle where the air is alternately compressed and expanded and no net power comes out of the cycle. <laughs> so, in fact, uh, for this situation, so, for this limiting situation, uh, T2S becomes equal to T3. In fact, if you um, look at this expression here, uh, if you set T2S equal to T3, then we can actually evaluate uh, uh, RP corresponding to this case. So, if for example, you take T3 over T1 to be 5, the corresponding value of pressure ratio comes out to be something like 128. So, for T3 over T1 equal to 5, uh, the, if the pressure ratio is 128 or thereabouts, then the exit temperature from the compressor is the same as the maximum allowed temperature in the cycle. So, you can see that that is a ridiculously high value for the pressure ratio, but it is good to know that is the upper bound on the uh, pressure ratio. <coughs>